Hello, it's Dr. Rafael Gutierrez, and last time I gave you a big introduction to everything that would be covered in a class. There are some topics which are obviously more important than others for that lecture. And today I'm going to talk about specifically biology, evolution, natural selection, and how we classify things in life. Now, I did put a picture of Charles Darwin because he is the father of evolution. And a lot of people don't realize the actually uh, amazing history that happened for us to get the idea of evolution and natural selection. Now, some people may ask, why is this important for anatomy, physiology, and microbiology? And the reason is actually a lot. One is a lot of the stuff in evolution is seen in embryology. We can also see problems that happen in, when, uh, con with congenital conditions because of the way we develop because of evolution. Natural selection is another very important topic, which is nature decides what moves on. Now, what the theory of evolution is, in short, evolution is a theory, and you notice that I put theory in capital, because remember, theory is a idea that has been tested with the, with the attempt to disprove it, but it survived. And so, in short, the evolution is the theory that over time species change to better suit the environment. Now, biological evolution is based on natural selection, or in other words, nature decides what traits are passed on to the next generation. And we can view evolution as a story of how life developed on Earth and how we got to where we are. And a lot of times we, again, like I said, we can see how disease processes are caused because of evolution. Now, where did the idea come from? Like I showed you the, uh, the picture at the beginning, it was actually described by Charles Darwin, who wrote a book on evolution and used the evidence, the evidence he collected on his trips. Now, one of the things you notice is it took him about 20 years to publish his book after he did his trip. And the reason is because it was a novel idea at the time. People didn't want to believe it. And again, science is about collecting evidence to try to disprove something or prove something. Or if the evidence goes, we can't reject the hypothesis, so we accept the theory. Now, there are a lot of different evidence for this descent with modification. One is the Darwin's finches. Pretty much you have a population of birds that live on different islands, and because of the stresses on these different islands, the birds changed. And so the species, the species looks different in different islands. Uh, now, the other thing we can actually see is in the uh, moths in England during, before, during, and after the Re Industrial Revolution. And the last one is embryology. And embryology is important, again, because of how the, how the body develops and issues we can end up getting because of it. Not just because of problems with embryology, but also with how the structure is as we act a bit different than a common ancestor. We can view evolution as a story of how life developed on Earth. And so one of the things we actually have to understand is that if we take any species and we look at for traits, traits usually fall under this bell-shaped curve, which is standard distribution. Now about 70, almost 70% will actually, of the population will fall for any given characteristic between two traits. Now, I actually use the example of humans. Now, in humans, if we're looking at height, the shortest individual that we were able to, I was able to find was a gentleman, was someone who was 26 inches, I'm sorry, 26 centimeters and inches tall. He might be on this side over here, one of the few individuals that short. On the opposite end, we have the tallest individual, which was recorded at 272 centimeters, roughly almost uh, nine feet, that gentleman would be over here. But our entire species, humans, for when it comes to height, you have a bell-shaped curve. Again, most people will be in this range, which the range would be at the shortage end of that range, would be about 73, 173 centimeters, roughly five foot six inches, to 193 centimeters, roughly six feet, three inches. Most people fall in this range, but there are people who 
again, are taller. There are some who are shorter. Now, there is a reason why these genes are actually more likely to be uh, middle. One is just random assortment. If there's multiple genes that actually encode for height, some people will receive all the genes that get you to be tall. Someone will get some of them, but most of them will be a mixture of really tall or really short, so they fall under the middle. And so we have physical traits, and if a physical trait helps a member survive, it will. So for instance, if we're dealing with our height, if, for instance, we have a place where shorter people tend to live longer, are able to reach reproductive year, and taller people are not, with time, this height will actually be skewed on one to this side. If being taller makes it more likely to re reach reproductive years, this will actually switch to the other opposite side. And so for you to have evolution, you do have, you do have to have a variation of genes within a population that can cause, can actually be beneficial sometimes or not depending on the circumstances. Now, one of the f clearest examples of evolution is in the evolution of moths. Now, I'm going to actually use the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, a lot of places in England had these white birch trees. And because of a change in evolution, these birch trees became extremely dark. One of the, hap one of the things that happened in, 19 in 1830s is there was a lot of coal being used for energy and so the coal soot would deposit on these trees making them darker if we look at moths prior to 1830s we actually had a variation of colors on one extreme we had moths that were mostly white with some black spots on the opposite we had really dark moths now if you think of this forest here you could see that if you have this white moth over here it would probably be hard for a predator to find, while this dark one would be a bit easier. And so usually you would, would find more of these white moths than these dark moths before the Industrial Revolution, but you would still have both of them. And there are traits in this one which could lead to dark moths and vice versa. Now, in 1830s, like I said, we have a massive amount of coal being burned and it coats buildings, it coats trees. And so if these, these trees end up having a charcoal color, you'll notice that this white moth would stick out. And so it'd be easier for birds and other predators that eat it to be able to eat it. And so these white moths during the Industrial Revolution would not survive as likely as these darker moths. And so the darker moth populations would grow. And that's what we actually see in insects collections in of uh, England at the time. We saw a shift from lighter moths to darker moths. Now the other thing we have is embryology. And I actually did take this from a, a website, Evolution Berkeley EDU, and it is associated with UC Berkeley. And one of the things that is showing you is if you look at a chicken embryo, you'd see these gill slits, and in humans you have gill slits. Now some people will say, no, they're not necessarily gill slits, they're other structures. But the problem is sometimes because of uh, different uh, chemicals that are added to the environment, there have been people who are born with pharyngeal gill slits that did not fuse. So we can actually see some people born with gill slits, like, a fi like pretty much certain types of fish. They were not functioning, but they did there are some people who are born with gill slits. We also have some people born with webbed fingers. And a lot of this has to do with something happening which doesn't allow the embryo to fully develop. And so you end up getting a reversion of some of the traits that are there. These genes for gill slits, for web uh, digits, are present in, society, in uh, the genes. And so if they don't go through certain things called apoptosis, they do show up. Now, how did this all happen? Well, I mentioned before how uh, at the beginning, we have the beginnings of the universe and atoms start forming molecules and molecules start forming more complex structures. And eventually we have the sun and the earth. And that's where we really want to be, begin. Now, we know this.
based on geology. Geologists have actually seen how the Earth changed over time and can date things based on radioactive carbon. Carbon actually decays at a certain rate and there is a certain amount of radioactive carbon that's present in all, society, in all the world. And so we can see how old different things are. Now, based on geological data, the original Earth had a high carbon dioxide atmosphere and it was an aqueous environment actually ended up forming. As the Earth cooled, pretty much vaporous water became water, liquid water, and you had a high amount of carbon dioxide. Now, if we actually think of 4.5 billion years ago, our sun develops and the planets clump and the Earth starts spewing methane and carbon dioxide until an interplanetary collision occurs, which forms our moon. And then the Earth starts to cool about three 8 billion years ago and that's where we start having the vaporous water change to liquid we can see this is a long period of time now in about 3.7 billion years ago we have carbon-based molecules begin to form and collect together to form the basics of life now the basic unit of life is a cell if you're taking anatomy eventually remember the cell is a basic unit of life all life is composed of cells. And for us to actually have life with a carbon-based structure, we do need water. And some of these carbon-based molecules came together to form hydrophilic and hydrophobic structures. One of the big things that's gonna help you in anatomy, physiology, and micro is breaking apart the word. So if you look at here, hydro is for water. Philic means love, so hydrophilic means love water, which means it can dissolve in water. Someone will be hydrophobic. You've come across words that say phobic before, and so you have things that are afraid of water, like oils, and so they'll separate. These are both carbon-based, but they'll react different to water. Now, due to heat in the earth, more complex structures form, such as something called a phospholipid. Now, again, if you break apart the word, lipid would be a fat molecule, a phospho, would be a something with a phosphorus. So a phospholipid would have phosphate head and fatty acid tails. As this does have hydropho a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion, the fats are hydrophobic and the phosphates are hydrophilic, they arrange in water forming two layers of membrane called a bilayer. So it's called the phospholipid bilayer. Bi means two layer. And so these form little bags of water inside water. Now within these cells, you have some carbon-based uh, structures which are called amino acids and they form, they bind together to form proteins. And these give these bags of water shape. And so we call them cytoskeletons. Cyto means cell, skeleton is what gives it a shape. Now, some of these proteins, some of the cytoskeletons even, can take heat and use that to build stronger, big, actually technically bigger structures. Anytime you take heat to build something bigger, we call it anabolism. It's part of metabolism. Anabolism is when you build something up and to build something, you need to put energy into it, which I'll mention a little bit more in the next slide. So when we actually are doing anabolism, building stuff up, we take energy to glue smaller structures to bigger ones. Now, I'm gonna use one that wouldn't be present exactly now in the uh, primitive world because of the carbon dioxide and methane causing a clouded atmosphere, but there are some plants that do this. Actually, plants do this. They take energy in the sort of light and combine, take carbon dioxide to make, and water to make sugar. So over here, you can see CO2. CO2 means one carbon, O is for oxygen, so two oxygens. H2O is water, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And if you get six carbon dioxide molecules and six waters, and you have energy, in the, in the case of plants, we use light. Uh, in the case of the prim primordial type of uh, cells, they would use a, a thermal energy from vents, for instance. And they can actually combine this to give you carbon dioxide and water joined as a sugar. C6, six carbon, H12, 12 hydrogens, O6. So if you notice the ratio here is you have 
six hydrogens and I'm sorry, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. So this is roughly our six water molecules. And so the carbon dioxide release is, releases the O2, which you can see here. So we start taking carbon dioxide out of the environment and releasing oxygen. Now this requires energy. And so in chemistry, it will be called an endothermic reaction. I want you to take the word endo and write it down because endo means inside. Thermic means heat or energy. And so an endothermic reaction is a reaction that takes energy from the environment and brings it into the bonds of a structure. So you can see the energy here is just not available here because it's now in these structures here. And so anytime you see endo, it's gonna be inside. Thermic means heat. I recommend taking these little root words and making a list for yourself so when you come across them in anatomy, physiology, microbiology, or even in a general bio class, you know what these words are telling you. Now, so we can build structures, but as we build structure, we also have certain proteins that can break other things across. And these proteins are, called, are protein catalysts, which means that they help a reaction occur, but they don't get used up. They're enzymes. And so you also have, besides the anabolic reactions, you have catabolic reactions. And in catabolic reactions, you break something big to make it smaller. Now, I want you to think of yourself. You take sugar, break it for energy, and what you end up releasing is carbon dioxide and water. So over here, you can see the example. C6H12O6 is your sugar molecule. And you're going to break it to get six carbon dioxides and six water molecules. And as these are smaller, you can tell because you only have one here and now you have six here, you end up getting energy. Now, the one thing I, did, I left out here is that to break this, in this case, you need more oxygen. And so you're actually taking sugar using oxygen to burn it into carbon dioxide and water. And what you get is, by burning it, is the energy which you use to move, to do stuff. So... We have catabolism where we're taking big molecules and breaking them to smaller ones. And what we're getting is energy released. Now I want you to take a look at this word. You have the word exo and you have thermic. We already talked about how thermic means heat or energy, heat technically. And so exothermic would be outside heat. So when you break something and you release energy, it's an exothermic reaction, which is telling you that you are releasing energy. Any reaction that gives you heat is exothermic. And so one of the things that happens is now we have a way to store energy in these bags with other chemicals. Now, once we have that, we also need to make more complex structures. And one of the things that actually happened is we started making proteins that could cause movement. Now, for you to be considered alive, you need to be able to move. You have to actually be able to react to stimuli. You actually can use this movement to try to gain energy by eating it. And that's what you're gonna break apart. So you're gonna actually move to get energy and use that energy. But you also need to copy a code that allows you to make these proteins. And copy the code so you, you can reproduce. And so at this point, our bag, once you have the genetic material, which will be DNA in most, well, in all life in, on this planet, and you have a way to copy the DNA, replicate it, you are, can now reproduce, which is a last requirement of life. And so all of life, as we determine it, is made up of cells. Now, the first cells we find are called the archaea. RK, like archaic, it means old. And they actually began about 3.5 billion years ago. So these actually start, start forming about 3.5 billion years ago. And they survive by taking uh, smaller molecules using heat vents to make larger molecules for structure or eating something, breaking it, and using that energy to move, to uh, make other things that they may want to move, make. So with this, we can actually now have 
evolution. So, three billion years ago, we have the first bacteria developed from archaea, and the way it actually did it is it changed its ribosomes. Now, the ribosomes are a protein that help you make other proteins, and it's a big difference. Now, both the archaea and the bacteria, which changed their chromosomes, continued to live. And so now, instead of having one type of cell, we have two types. We have the archaea and the bacteria. And the ribosomes are the big change that actually happened. Now, about 2.4 billion years ago, a type of bacteria called the cyanobacteria developed. The neat thing about this bacteria is it was a first cell that can actually use photosynthesis. What ends up happening is as you're using carbon dioxide dissolved in water, it actually will pull it out of the uh, out of the water and as water cycles from uh, liquid water to vapor back to liquid, it will pull down carbon dioxide mixed with water. And one of the nice things that these first cyanobacteria did is they took the carbon dioxide, water and energy from light in this case and made sugar and oxygen. Oxygen got released and so we start getting more and more oxygen in the atmosphere and we have less carbon dioxide. Now, based on what geology tells us, based on what we know about of the world, as this occurs, less carbon in the environment causes the earth to cool. And it cools so rapidly that we start getting our first ice age. And so things change. Now, as we now have more oxygen in the environment, it makes any organism that is too sensitive to to oxygen levels to disappear in certain areas. It will move to other areas. And so, like I said, our case still exists today. Today, it usually is found in heat vents, but most of our environment has higher levels of oxygen, which allow for cells that can tolerate oxygen to survive better in most of the wild environment. And so our case tends to only be found in certain environments. Now, Carbon trap, now one of the things that people argue with is whether carbon causes warming. Now we do know carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes heat trapping. It traps heat inside, so light comes in and with carbon dioxide, it keeps light from re leaving the earth. And so it ends up causing more energy, which causes more heat. And if we remove the carbon, the earth is cooling, which is what we're talking about. Now, one thing, like I said, there are some people who want to say, oh, we don't know if higher levels of carbon change the uh, ecosystem, but there is a consensus, a true consensus within every chemist, every uh, physicist, every ecologist, every geologist, that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and higher levels do lead to a warming of the earth and lowering carbon dioxide leads to a cooling. We've seen this before, and there's an experiment you could do on your own called the brown, uh, uh, brown box experiment, which if you Google it, you can find hundreds of ways you can actually do this experiment at home relatively easy. Now, two billion years ago, an archaea bac bacteria developed a membrane around its genetic material, around its DNA, and archaea bacteria developed a membrane and then also developed organ-bound organ organelles. And so we have a third type of cell that develops now, which is called the eukaryotic cell. The interesting thing about the eukaryotic cell is it has organ-bound organelles. Organelles are little organs. And one of the organelles has its own DNA, not just a nucleus, but another one called the mitochondria. And what we believe happened is a eukaryotic cell tried to eat a bacteria and the, a primitive bacteria and didn't completely de eat it. But what ended up happening is the, that uh, bacteria was able to take the breakdown products of the incomplete breakdown products of sugar, uh, something called pyruvate. And it could take pyruvate, mix it with oxygen and completely break it down to carbon dioxide and water. And that's actually what you use for most of your energy. If you just take sugar and break it in half, you get a little bit of energy. Uh, usually it's a net two gain of something called ATP, which I'll talk about later. If you take your 
broke down products, which is called pyruvate, takes it to the mitochondria, use oxygen and do a bunch of different chemical reactions, you end up getting carbon dioxide and you end up getting over 30, uh, over four, 30 or 40 ATPs. It's not that I don't remember, it's that it varies between uh, book to book. And so now we have our, our first classification, big classification called kingdoms. In biology, we break everything down into groups so they're easier to study. So we have the RK bacteria, or RK, which are the first cells that would change over time. Again, remember, some of these are still alive in either really salty areas with low levels of oxygen or really hot areas where most things can't survive. But the interesting thing is RK cannot survive in what we consider a normal, comfortable environment. We also have bacteria, which change their ribosomes, and it's a protein that makes other proteins and continue to survive. And these are actually the main ones that you usually talk about in microbiology, the bacteria. And bacteria continue to, to survive and evolve. And the best way to look at bacterial evolution is in hospitals. As you have a lot of antibiotics, any bacteria that's, that is sensitive to the antibiotic will die. And so only bacteria who are resistant to certain antibiotics can survive. And so in hospitals, bacteria have evolved in at times to a point where there is very few, if any, antibiotics that can kill them. And so that's why hospital infections, when people get infections in hospital, it's such a worrying thing because they will be immune or really resistant to most antibiotics. And they will continue to evolve. And you can see these evolve in real time and you can actually watch them evolve over uh, days, months, because of how fast they reproduce. And then we have the eukaryotes, which are the ones we are actually based on. So the three kingdoms are archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. Humans fall under eukaryotes, eukarya. And these are most of the cells found in the human body and in most animals. They're actually going to be most of the multicell, actually they're going to be all the multicellular organisms, organisms you can see and some that aren't. These are going to continue to evolve as well and some of them will evolve uh, cells that actually form into animals and eventually humans. And so we do have these classifications of cells which are important. There, that is our basic classification of kingdoms. So you have three kingdoms, RK. Oldest cells still around, still evolving. Eukaryo, they're actually probably the newest cells and they are direct branch from RK. And we have bacteria, which are direct branch from RK, but they're actually a lot more different than RK, than the eukaryo. And they continue to evolve and are present everywhere. Actually, there's more bacteria on your body than eukaryotic cells, if this is interesting. Now, if you're considered alive, you must be made of cells. So viruses are technically not alive, but they do have certain things that are interesting that we can talk about later. Over here, we see the, ba the basic phylogenetic tree of life. So you can see the bacteria, you can see the archaea, and you can see the eukarya. The most, probably the first type of cell was more similar to the archaea and the eukaryotes than bacteria because of ribosome changes that occur, but we'll talk about that as we go. Now that we have all these different ideas, we can actually talk about how we classify life. Now I'm going to use humans. If you remember, we have domains, which is cell types. And in the domains, we actually have the RK, the bacteria, and the eukarya. Humans would fall under eukarya. Now, as evolution continues to occur, we actually have more divisions and we end up getting kingdoms. And kingdoms are organisms that are more closely related. In eukaryotes, we have plants, fungi, animalia, protista. Us humans, we fall under the animal. But you have different organisms that can actually continue to evolve and change. And so you have variations. Then we get into phyla. And phyla are another class of organisms. And humans have a backbone. Not all animals have backbones, but if we have backbones or actually a central nervous system, they actually usually fall under chordata. Chordata then are actually uh, 
broken down into classes. Phyla are broken down into classes. For humans, it would be mammals. And if you look at mammals, they have hair, they regulate body temperature, not only, it's not that, just that, but there's all these different classifications that cause people to be mam to be animals, to be mammals. And so we have mammalia, which are all the mammals. And classes can be broken down into orders. And so humans fall under the primate order, like other monkeys, pretty much. And we see how these animals are more closely related, both in genes and in how they actually appear. Now, as we continue, we have humans, which fall under the genus Homo. And we're the only uh, genus Homo left. Uh, we probably killed everyone else, which leads to our Homo sapien. Homo means same sapien wise, which uh, based on some of the stuff we have seen, I think we're being a little arrogant with that. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I will talk a lot more about evolution and natural selection as we go along, uh, but this should give you a basic understanding so we can move on and see how evolution occurs and how things continue to change. Have a nice day.